What's up, everybody? It's your boy, Adrian Nice. Welcome to uh, another episode of Mouth and Out. We're at the world-famous uh, Audio Box Studios in Charlotte, North Carolina. Right now, I'm here with... Cooper Lambert. Big Coop in the building. <laughs> How you doing today? I'm good, man. How about you? I'm good, too, bro. Just uh, thanks for taking the time out your day. Come chop it up. What up? Man, you know it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's get into it. So before, you know... Um, we hop into the brand. We hop into the music. Um, I want to talk about, I like to give my audience a little background about yeah. you. Um, where were you born and where did you grow up at? I was born in Atlanta, Georgia in 1992. And then my family and I, we moved to Rock Hill in 96 after the Olympics. And... Uh, yeah, I've been here ever since. I actually moved back to Atlanta for school and lived there for six years. So I've lived in between Charlotte and Atlanta most of my life. Uh, when you say you went back there for school, was it for college or was it for high school? Or uh, Yeah, college. It was my second stint in college. I, I went to college at Charleston for two years, and then I ended up transferring to Georgia State. What would you go for? Uh, like entrepreneurship. I ended up dropping out, but... Yeah. That's cool. Uh, yeah, I studied like music business and a bunch of cool stuff, but I I said fuck school, so. Hey, a lot of our most successful people in the world right now that people look up to, they dropped out of school too, you know, Steve Jobs. A lot of, a lot of people. I could go down the list, but a lot of people. Um so you don't really need school. It's just about knowing what you want in life, I guess, yeah. and getting it. I would say those people were a little bit of inspiration for me, for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's dope. Um, okay, so, <clears throat> and what was it? Well, what was it like growing up? Uh, you said y'all moved to Rock Hill, uh, ninety six. You were like four or five. Yeah, I was like four, and we moved here, and we lived uh, in an apartment. Then we moved to a house in Fort Mill, and it was cool. Um, I went to school in Rock Hill, though, so it was always like, yeah, I went to a small private school called Westminster. As far as like friends, like did you have friends in Fort Mill or were your friends coming out of the private school or how? It was kind of all over the Rock Hill, Fort Mill area. Most of the time I would have to drive like 20 minutes to Rock Hill or anywhere. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's the weird thing about going to like a small private Christian school is like you get you, you only have like 50 kids in your grade and they're all from like a 30 minute area away so is there a reason why your parents wanted you to go to a private school yeah my, my grandfather he worked there when i was in kindergarten so i just kind of started there and then all my friends were there so i didn't really know anybody in fort mill so it was kind of a weird way to grow up but um yeah, I met some really cool people there for sure that I'm still friends with today. So that's dope. Yeah, hell yeah. Ah! Okay, so growing up, when did we get into music? Um, you know, a, a bird told me, you know, you like to produce yeah. <laughs> and everything. When did that come into play? Yeah, I've been known to produce and make make some jams every now and then. Um, I would say around like 12 or 13, I, I started playing guitar. I got a Yamaha acoustic for Christmas and started taking lessons for a few years. And I don't know, after that, um, through high school, I was just playing guitar. Me and my buddy had like kind of a little like MySpace band. Like MySpace, hey, MySpace for all you. Yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, uh, through college, that kind of transformed into. Uh, this group we had called the Kleptos, and we made like experimental like hip hop and rock and like just like putting a bunch of genres together. And out of that, I started like really just chopping up the beats, started sampling a lot, and ended up calling myself the Klepto for a while. So yeah, I produced a lot of stuff under that name with uh, like Diamond Miller and 
So yeah, just uh, been making music, probably making beats for like 10 years now. Um, so <clears throat> in your household, were your parents into music at all? Like were they playing music around the house? Were they in the industry at all or anything like that? Or where did, uh, I guess, the what made you get into, you know? Yeah, so um, both my parents are teachers. My dad is a professor at UNC Charlotte. And my mom's a high school and middle school art teacher. So um, I didn't really grow up with that much music around. It was a lot of like math and art because that's what they teach. But um, my dad also plays like the trombone or euphonium like for the church. So um, I guess he, he kind of pushed me to learn like how to play an instrument. And from there, I just kind of took it and ran with it. Did you ever play uh, the guitar in the church or? Oh, no, no, nah, nah, that wasn't. I was more into Nirvana and shit like that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I only ask that because, you know, a lot of our great, uh, you know, people in the music industry or entertainment industry, they started out in the church. So I was just curious about that. <clears throat> I, mean, I, I played like we had like chapel at my school. So I would play like in front of the school occasionally with like the band. What's it like going to a Christian school? All Christian. It's kind of weird, man. I mean, like, I don't know. It was just like, there were cool people there for sure. It was just like, it's so small. That was the biggest thing. And the, just them pushing the religious shit a little too much is like, all right, like, let's, let's all chill and take this down a notch, you know? <laughs> so I know, so, okay, you're going to this Christian school and you have your friends at Christian school. And then I'm guessing you have friends outside of Christian school that are just going to public school or whatever the case may be. Uh, was there a difference in, I guess, the way they acted versus? Yeah. I mean, like, in, Cause I mean, at a Christian school, you know, you're not supposed to be having sex or smoking or any of that shit. So you got to keep it on the low. And so, yeah, you know, when I started smoking weed in like 10th grade, it was like ha hanging out, playing disc golf with like, you know, kids that went to public school and mm -hmm. I would just kind of keep that low key. Um, cause it was real clicky yet because it's such a small school where we get around and like people gossip. So that's kind of what it was like. Like, I mean, kids are still kids at any school, you know what I'm saying? Kids are always up to shit. So were you ever like questioning a lot of things? Yeah, definitely. Like when you get religion forced on you that much, like for 12 years, it definitely made me like question like a lot of things that, uh, didn't seem to make sense in the Bible. Like, I ultimately just came to my peace with God and everything, but I wouldn't say I'm super, like, religious. I'm more just, like, spiritual. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's cool. I I'm just asking these questions because uh, we had a guy uh, a couple of days ago. He um, grew up, like, on a farm, a really sheltered life, but religion pushed on him hard type stuff. So I was just curious about that because I really get to talk to you know, yeah. people. So I'm just curious from your perspective. Uh, yeah, for sure. I'm down to talk about whatever, really, man. <laughs> so, okay. And no, no, no. And then, you know, I just got a couple more. And so um, with that being the case, you know, you growing up uh, um, with, I guess, as you say, like it being pushed on you. Um, do you think that had some play into you uh, being more interested in stuff? like, you know, weed or whatever the case may be, not dealing with that type of stuff? Um, Are you being more curious, you know? I think really, like, to a certain extent, yes, but not really. I think just, like, when I started playing music and, like, I went through, like, ACDC phase, a Bob Marley phase, Nirvana phase, just learning more about the artists I like, kind of, like, I was always into my own shit, so I was, I was always, like, researching bands and, and musicians and and like I guess all that and like that 70s show was real popular it just made me want to be like a stoner you know what I'm saying so like yeah like that that's kind of what it was but I don't know I've always just been creative and uh kind of good with numbers and shit so yeah having a math wait no yeah. you know math and art being a yeah so I feel like that helps me with the beats because 
producing beats and and mixing and mastering is like a a, a numbers based thing half the time you know what uh software did you start on fruity loops no. uh garage band and then just merge that right into logic 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 9 at first now i use logic pro x okay. so when you started sampling instruments and stuff like that um what was that whole experience like or i mean like what made you go into the transition of instrumentating and all that? i guess like when i first got into hip-hop it was like 90s sample based hip-hop and then on the other end of the spectrum was like rock like mm -hmm. like anything from pink floyd to b like even reggae and bob marley and then the more i got into jazz too just mixing all those inspirations together kind of uh it seemed natural to go from making guitar beats mm -hmm. to like let me try and sample and chop up some records and my buddy that I was in the group with, he actually moved to Pittsburgh. So I was kind of just on my own, like after a few years of starting to make beats. So I figured I can do so much crazy shit with sampling. Yeah. And I was into Joey Badass, like real heavy at the time. So in like 2012 is when I really started sampling. And, you know, just like, like anything in music, you, you have like when you're producing, um, or recording it's like you you have like your good takes and your bad takes and you just it takes so long to learn so much about these like softwares that i've made like thousands of beats and shit and i've definitely made a bunch of trash ass <laughs> stuff along the way but you know it all like it's all you gotta fail to um to learn you know so like i've definitely like put out shit on the internet that I totally regretted and like just probably other people don't view it as bad as me but I'm like a perfectionist so I like I see the mistakes I made and I now I'm to a point after 10 years where I'm real hesitant to upload anything because I want it to I want to make my mark with the next stuff that I really put on the internet to not have that feeling you know nah i totally understand because you know it's like that because i make films and stuff like that it's totally like that uh as a filmmaker and everything but you know at some point you just gotta <laughs> put it up <laughs> yeah say fuck it and just put it out there you know how it's well you know because as creatives we're very hard on ourselves you know what i'm saying and it and you know just because we don't like some, them probably be the ones that the world's going to like or it might go up, you know, as far as, you know, yeah. you know what I'm saying? So you never know. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, started making or started playing instruments. Um, we into producing. Uh, we're making, we're sampling stuff, chopping it up, experimenting, doing our own thing. When did we come into, um, I guess, working with artists rappers stuff like that so right out the gate in charleston um my buddy was living here in the charlotte area and i was down in charleston but we had started in high school like making writing songs together so we started sort of making beats and tracking them back and forth or he would come down or when i would be back here we would make them and pretty much out the gate we had like rappers on our shit like th there's there's one that's still up on youtube it's called little bit of this with low easy and drew kid and that was like the first one that we dropped that was like the first rap song i ever recorded with anybody and and it was one of those that i don't regret it's like it, it's like going on 10 years old but i still bump that shit and it like got a thousand plays in 2011 on SoundCloud and that was like a big deal back then. Yeah. So like it was a good mark. That was kind of how I entered the game as a producer. And shout out to Lil Easy and Drew Kid in the building. Yeah, you know. Lil Easy, he just had a kid. He's out there in Myrtle Beach and then Drew Kid lives up I believe still in Harlem. So Charleston's just a place where you meet a lot of people from like all different different parts of the country. Yeah. That's that's something I can definitely say about all the Carolinas. Like, that's why I like 
um, being here because, you know, you got up north people coming here from Florida, you know, L.A. people come here, Atlanta people, all yeah. types of stuff. And Charlotte, I feel like in the last 10 years has definitely gotten a lot more like that because growing up, it was just sort of this banking city. And after work, you know, there was not much to do. And, you, you know, like Fort Mill, Rock Hill, there was not shit to do. <laughs> <laughs> But no, it's getting pretty lit now. Like, I mean, due to COVID and shit, there's not much going on. But I, I like where Charlotte's been going. How do you feel about um, the baby um, blowing up out of Charlotte or the Carolinas? You know, if you're from, we refer to it as Carolinas, and bringing light towards this area. Well, I was down in Atlanta when that happened, and I was, I was just like super proud. I was like telling everybody in Atlanta, like watch out for Charlotte. Like the way I would always say it is like Atlanta is the King city, but, and then Charlotte's the Queens queen city. Like if you look at the Southeast. So I think that Charlotte's always been like maybe 10, 15 years behind Atlanta in a lot of development mm -hmm. and for the baby to pop off, it kind of just to me, like it's a signifying moment for Charlotte as a whole. And and he's repping. That's what's dope is like he's wearing the Charlotte Hornet shit and he's putting people on to the city because that's what Charlotte needs. And he's dope, too. You know, like you, you, you can say what you want if you like top 40 kind of music or not. But like the baby's talented and fresh and I'm glad he's representing. Big <laughs> yeah, I'm with you 100 percent, 100 percent. Um uh, let's talk about the artist. Uh, so there's an artist that you work with um, a lot. Um, what's it? Uh, Diamond Miller. So it's spelled. I didn't want to say it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a little hard for some people, but once you figure it out, once you listen to his music, uh, like we all call him D or Diamond. Like, you know, like it's spelled like Diamond with a capital A. So, um, but it makes him more unique. So I fuck with it. Like. So, uh, you work with him a lot? Yeah, yeah, that's my my brother. Like, we've, I met him in like 2011, and um, I kind of met him through like Super Plane. Like, when I was doing that stuff down in Charleston, I ended up dropping out and moving back home. And then I met I, I met all the dudes when they were starting Super Plane, and Diamond and me were both a part of that, and that's how we linked. And the first day I met him we were actually shooting a video here in Uptown. And so the first day I meet him, I'm in his video. <laughs> and so like that just, I think that kind of just like sealed the, the fate of it all. Like since then we've made like two projects together and I've like been on the back end, either like managing or, or marketing or help mixing, mastering or produce on most of his projects since 2011. <laughs> Ah! Speaking of super plain, <laughs> y'all see it? Y'all see it? Um, <laughs> so what this kind of, I mean, I don't want to say it reminds me of it, but so what's the that brand? Uh, this is totally different, but damn it. Start, I'm going to spell it out for you. I don't know how to. Uh, it's P-A-T-A-O-N-G-I-A. -A -A, I think it's something like that. Yeah, because you know how they have the word and then they have the three, the colors, yeah. but it's more like a mountain type or outdoors, I guess. Yeah, for sure. But that just kind of reminds me of it because you got the three colors and everything like that. But I fucks with your brand a lot more the way it is and the way it is on the clothes and everything. It's not too extra. It's not it's just super plain. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, I talked briefly about the name klepto and the kleptos i think like it's what that always meant to me was not like i like stealing shit but it's like as artists we all kind of steal from each other and then reinterpret stuff and i think that that's the best way to create art to a certain degree and push art forward mm -hmm. and there's no proprietary rights to influencing somebody like if they're not directly copying you then they're pushing art forward. And like, I think Van, G Van Gogh like spoke on things like this. So that captivated me from the get go. Cause everybody tries to emulate, emulate what um, 
influence them like when they're making beats or they're writing yeah. songs or whatever so with the brand it was kind of similar because i think like just the name nick horton who goes by atticus thatcher another uh vocalist that i've worked with for like the same amount of time part of super plane he he coined the the brand name super plane I think kind of influenced by a lot of streetwear brands like Supreme and mm -hmm. and um, Obey and and uh, even like some of, he said like some of the designs I was doing before with like the Kleptos I was going for that same kind of look and he coined that minimalist look as super plain so from there it was like a collective effort of people like contributing to the brand and we always have gotten that sort of like oh it kind of looks like Supreme and I think a lot of that is because of the SUP for sure. You know, that's that's pretty close right there. But um, you know, I've always like that was in 2011 when when it started. And shout out to to Nick Horton. Shout out to Nick Gregory. In the building. In the building. Shout out to NASA. In the building. Okay, Jordan. Jordan Isaac. You might know him. He DJs around Charlotte and shit, but. Shout out to so many more. Justin Jong. In the building. There's a lot of people that, that contributed in, in the early days. So um, I didn't really start, like, really designing until, like, 2014. And that I think around there, maybe 15, 16 is when I kind of created this pa more Patagonia, like you're saying, design. And I was, like, that's when, like, Patagonia sort of entered the broader mainstream a little yeah. bit more it became less of just a snobby thing to something that everybody could wear more again you know what i'm saying so i was like inspired by the colorways and i just love box logos so i wanted to make my own unique one that fit in and i don't people do bring up the supreme or the patagonia a lot and that's, ca that, like, it, that's cool though i you know because you know it's not them it's not like you're uh like the words not even the same or anything like that. The only I, I like if I was you or if I was you guys, I would like yeah. that they're bringing it up because that helps you guys determine who your target market is yeah. even more. Yeah. You know and I, I do think it is a, a drawing inspiration from uh, a little bit of, of brands like that. Not just those those brands, but and and uh, a lot of people don't know specifically with Supreme. Supreme actually directly copied this artist style as obey did early and a, a couple other brands um this artist called barbara kruger she was doing these in i believe the 70s 80s she was doing these black and white uh like portrait style images with like a, a box red logo text with that futura font like over it that was her art style like i think she was contemporary like andy warhol and a part of that movement but so supreme was uh an ode to her style directly same font and everything and she actually ended up not fucking with <laughs> she's like y'all biting my <laughs> so yeah that's a little known fact but um it kind of she's just a part of like minimalism so at a whole, like what a lot of streetwear brands do represent, like minimalism, and I think our name Super Plain is a very great minimalist name. You know, you guys um, gotten together um, and talked about like what's the goal for this brand? Where do y'all want to see it in the future? What direction you guys are going in? Yeah, I mean we've d been doing this. You know, like I think in the summer it's gonna be like the actual ten year mark, but um. You know, we've always had big ideas that, that we want. I think, like, we used to talk about a store just more in, in broader terms, but I think that's become my my main goal is, like, down the line get a store, maybe a couple stores in just, like, cool places, like, I don't know, Asheville or Charleston or Atlanta, Charlotte. Mm -hmm. Some places a little close to home and... Um, yeah, I guess just grow the brand. I, I've been thinking of a lot of stuff. Like, I could talk for hours. Well, yeah, I, I was about, since I have you here and not them, I kind of just want to dive more into, like, what you, I guess, um, 
some of your ideas for the brand. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> you can't speak for them, and you know, yeah, they're not here. I mean, lately I've been working for this place uh, store here called Old News Vintage. In the building. Shout out Old News Vintage. Shout out Nate. Shout out uh, Taylor. Shout out Anna. Shout out Carter. Shout out Boof, even though I never really even saw him. <laughs> he's he he's back in Ohio, but he used to work there. Um, so yeah, uh, that job's been teaching me a lot more about like the manufacturing styles of different clothing and paying attention to the materials more. It's a clothing brand, or it's a clothing store. So we sell everything from like the '50s, '60s to like early 2000s and stuff like that, and just thrifting out the bins and and i've been i've been selling vintage that's how i got got into i was with old news i was um screen printing and and thrifting and selling clothes on deep deep pop and so it was kind of just a good fit and um you can check out super plain vintage and old news vtg on deep pop and buy some shit if you want uh, go ahead and drop the instagrams also yeah, and so uh, for Old News, it's at Old News VTG. And then for Super Plain, we have Super Plain Vintage and at We Are Super Plain. Spelled how it sounds. Yeah, Super P L A I N. Super Plain. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Um, so are we still producing? Are we still in the music? Or are we taking a break from music right now? Uh, it's kind of a mix of both. Like, actively, I don't make beats as much as I used to at all. And I fucked up my wrist from too much wrist work, so. Yeah, and I used to punch stuff, so I think that's, uh, like, I used to do with it. Issues, yeah, but, but anyway, since that happened, I haven't been, like, Photoshopping or, like, using Logic as much, because I think that was kind of what did me in on my wrist a little bit too um and like disc golf it was a whole bunch of shit it was a wild <laughs> summer i was working my ass off but um yeah so uh i me and diamond actually low-key just finished up a project that we have been working on for exclusive time. yeah uh, like some of the tracks are are actually remastered and they're pretty old and then some are, are more current. And I would say we were really focused on that project for like a year, a little over a year. So he's got another project coming out before that. And then our project's going to drop. So do we got a name? Uh, you yeah, really? It's called uh, Sons of the Carolinas. Sons of the Carolinas. Y'all be on the lookout for that. Do you have like an estimated date, estimated month, anything like that? Or uh, well, his... His project that I have one song on called Off Days is right around the corner. Like, I I forget the exact date, but it's, like, late January, early February. So we're going to sort of see see that how that one plays out, and we don't want to rush another project right behind it to give that project a little bit of time, you know. We're going to get it 2021. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It should be like, you know, like a couple months after that. We we still have to button up all that detail and I might should try and come up here and get some of these Y'all should. mixed a little better, you know what I'm saying? Like Yeah. Top notch producers in here. This is a dope studio by the way. What's the name of Audio Box Studios. The world famous Audio Box Studios. You need to check it out. Come up here. This is, and so he hasn't even seen the front side, guys. So for all you guys that seen the front side, he ain't even seen that yet. So he's in, uh, you know, in for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Um, so you said you're looking to get stores, and you're talking about brick and mortar stores. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about COVID? Um, do you think COVID will go away to where you know people uh, actively go outside and uh, you know go store to store? Yeah, I mean, we we've implement we followed the mandates at this th at Old News where I work now, and um, you know we have limited capacity, and people are willing to wait out out front, and everybody wears masks and socially distanced. So, I mean, it, it's worked. Like, um, so I guess I'm not as worried, but I have been thinking of other um, ways to utilize the internet, like 
my buddy was telling me about some crazy shit like a, a VR store where you can like just virtually like like view the clothes to get a better sense and maybe like I mean that's probably down the line obviously we're not developing that right but but yeah, you never like know could maybe like um, obviously like that doesn't require a brick and mortar store but I view a brick and mortar store as good overhead because there's nothing like that that clean in-person sale and people want to try on stuff and I think as long as we can have like a, a facility adjacent to that store where we can run the e-commerce e and and like have like production equipment and I, I eventually want to like I think it'd be really sick to grow our own hoodies like heard uh uh no jumper yeah well, he, they had the store and everything and they were doing their podcast out in the back you know i think they shut their store down but they're still like i think they got a bigger place though to do more different stuff you know what i'm saying yeah. you know they grew their brand solid you know what i'm saying oh, yeah. a lot of people know yeah man i mean i think it's really i think boutique stores are gonna come back into demand uh once we get past covid Will we get past COVID? I, I don't know, man. We'll see. Have you ever? Have you guys thought about um, uh, placing the brand in other already established boutique? Yeah, I mean that would be cool. I'd be open to it. I think we just need to like just get uh get some more get a more expensive line out and and up our our um, quantity. And really grow the bl grow the brand like naturally, and I would be open to that. I think it would just have to be the right kind of fit. Um, she definitely fuck with Family Matters. Have you heard of them? Oh yeah, yeah. I've I've uh, reached out s to Samir before. Yeah, yeah. Back in the day, but yeah, yeah. I, I know, I know the, um, that whole wave. I haven't been over to the shop. I I don't think I've ever been there, but. I met them at like the AMCS bodega back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm open to it really, man. Like we just gotta get get it cranking out a little more, you know. Let me tell you this. You know, I'm about to be in LA. <laughs> you know, Cody's out in LA. So like if you need us to push the brand on the West Coast, I don't know if you have more friends out there. You know, we're more like on the visual side, but like I, you know, I'm starting to be in front of the camera be beside some notable people so if you need us to push the brand yeah. you know i'm down i'm sure he's down too should say less man let's get it <laughs> <laughs> okay um so what's next for you i mean like do you have plans for 2021 um i know uh yeah what's what's next so uh pertaining to just like super plain i mean i already talked about the the music project that's going to come out and but as far as just the brand, we're dropping a collection of hoodies coming very, very soon. They're actually already on the website, so you can preview them. The release date will be coming shortly. Um, stay tuned to our Instagram for more info. And we got th uh, three different colors, red, green, and blue, like RGB kind of theme, which is, yeah, what the, em their embroidered champion hoodies. So, yeah, maybe we can get a closer shot at the end. But I was wearing it just so y'all could get a sneak peek. And also, I brought you some. Hey! The 101. Hell yeah. Collecting a lot of, like, blank one of one uh, vintage products and screen printing our logos on it with different colorways. Yeah. So, this is the one of one of one of ones. You know what I'm saying? So, that's. For me? Here, let me, yeah. you know, I'll get a little. Dang, you know, this might be worth, you know, $10,000 one day, goddamn me. <laughs> you never know. Okay, way, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Damn, I really appreciate this, bro. Yeah, man. And, uh, you know, if I didn't uh, ask your size, so, like, if it's... What size is this? It's a large. It's cool. But, yeah, I, there's more where that came from. I got a bunch of uh, one-of-ones coming out. I'm going to try and roll those out on our Super Plain Vintage page more frequently. Mm -hmm. I've been doing the thrifted and printed 
collection. Uh, shout out to anybody who's bought a thrifted and printed product from me. Um, but yeah, I'm going to try and, and really make more nice custom one of ones uh, with unique colorways. And, and we, we really want to grow it into where people can pick their own colors and we would have enough. Yeah. So that people kind of like Nike ID or something like choose your design, your own colorways and stuff. Ah! Um, so we have this final segment called, uh, one piece of advice. Okay. So I'm asking you a couple of questions. Uh, so first, uh, I would like for you to give one piece of advice to up and coming producers wanting to, get into the industry and everything to make it all right uh buy an mpk mini i would definitely do that um definitely be willing to pay more for shit i i definitely pirated a, a lot of software like low-key but I think you got to invest into yourself so it's all about resourcing yourself to grow right and so definitely watch YouTube videos, learn as much as you can and find someone who can really give you that, that creative or constructive criticism that uh, is not telling you you suck, but saying like, hey man, this is how you mix and master. Like, cause that's just really important. And if your shit isn't mixed and mastered right, nobody's ever gonna really hear how great it could be. So just if that helps, I, I hope. <laughs> I'm sure, yeah. Um, okay, so now give one piece of advice to um, up-and-coming entrepreneurs wanting, looking to start their own clothing brand, um, you know, all of that. Yeah, I would say just definitely learn how to do as much of it as you can on your own. And um, for me, just like I, I, when I moved back from Atlanta, I, I'm – staying with my parents again and it's really been a blessing through covid because now they're they've allowed me to use their garage to like screen print and photograph all the stuff for listings and and i make music in there so just do what you can and and make the sacrifices in your social life or whatever it takes to get in a place where you actually have like like li a literal space to set up stuff and then start finding what are the tools I need to really build what I'm trying to do. And do you think that's important to have kind of your, like your own space? I think it's often the most overlooked thing is the space. Like, I mean, we're in a studio right now and you know, it, studios are, are kind of hard to come by if you don't have a lot of money um, starting out. But if you can just find some way to not just be doing this by like shitty means with shitty headphones, like, or, or for me with the brand, it's like, I need a space first if I want to screen print and then I have to get the, the screen printing equipment. So I think when I was living in Atlanta in a one bedroom apartment where I could hear my neighbors, every footstep, it, it just wasn't a good setup for me to do anything that I was wanting to do other than go to work and come home and yeah so I think it takes sacrifices to when you're starting out unless you're just a super rich kid who can buy whatever or whatever like you gotta take some sacrifices to find like a space to do what you want to do and sometimes that's the hardest part and just don't give up on on whatever you're trying to do and just practice it in that space once you have it and don't take it for granted you know don't give up don't take it for granted and keep going yes, sir. i'm with it all right and for the last one give one piece of advice to 21 year old you oh, man. what would you tell that guy what was he doing where was he <laughs> what would you tell 21 year old Cool. Oh man, stop being a dumbass. Like, get your shit together. Stop drinking so much. Don't wreck your car in two years. Yeah, I don't know. So much, man. I think like a lot of it when you're 21, you think that 
you know everything or you or you, your ego you haven't checked your ego because i feel like a lot of 20 year, 21 year olds don't really understand their ego yet so i guess i would just try and tell myself like hey check your ego every now now and then like you're still so young and developing and you don't just don't don't be such a dumbass man <laughs> like i feel like most 21 year old dudes are just doing shit that they look back later and they're like man what the fuck was i doing yeah. back then <laughs> like so I, you know just but i i don't really have too many regrets like i think you gotta like i said earlier you gotta fail to learn to grow but yeah man i think i was just taking more risks with like drinking and partying a little bit back then so I'll tone it back a little bit. yeah just kind of chill you know it's all gonna be good <laughs> i ain't mad at that one bit um all right before we go any last words from you um before we go uh just thanks for having me man uh this is dope and you know uh be it, since we're on youtube now look out for uh super plain youtube channels coming soon we're gonna have uh an ad for the hoodie drop and and so we're hoping to start feeding more content regularly to youtube and follow and subscribe to mouth and out. yeah follow subscribe to our channel it's mouth and out m-o-u-t-h-i-n-o-u-t -O -O -T. um and go ahead and drop your instagram one more time so follow me personally at cooper lambert i don't really post a lot but you can keep in contact with me there and then follow the brand at we are super plain and check out at super plain vintage we do some cool stuff there too and the links to the websites are in the bio yeah, yeah, so the website is superplane.co.co. .co. Yeah, so check us out there too as well. All right, there you have it, guys. Thank you guys for joining us one more time. Uh, like I always say, F what you talking about, because over here we mouthing out. Peace! <laughs> ah!